Welcome to the ground instruction video for exercise 23 pilot navigation, this one looking at VFR charts and the navigation log. Because this is such a large topic, this is the first video in a series of videos that will look at pilot navigation. If you want to see the other ones, you'll have to look in the description below where I will put all the links. Remember, we're looking at VFR flight planning and not IFR flight planning in this video. So we'll start off with the question, why? Why are we doing this? And why am I teaching this? Well, one is because I have to as an instructor, and the other is because in your flight test, you're going to have to demonstrate that you know how to do this. So exercise 23, pilot navigation, the point of this is to show the examiner that you have all the tools in your mind to efficiently plan a visual flight reference cross-country flight and to demonstrate that you can do it safely. Basically, the examiner, when they give you the flight test, they want to know that when they grant you this license that you're going to be able to plan flights and fly around and return safely. The reason that pilot navigation is such a big topic is because it takes everything that you're learning in the private pilot license in regards to aviation and puts it all together in kind of like a nice, neat package. So in order to teach this, I'm going to be unpacking all of the elements, and then in the end, we'll put them all back together again, and hopefully you'll have all the tools in your mind to be able to fly around or at least plan a flight safely. Let's start off by thinking about where you want to go and how you want to get there. For example, I used to fly a lot out of Langley Airport in British Columbia, and so a typical flight test route would take you from Langley Airport to Chilliwack Airport, which is just to the east. Now, the most efficient way to get from Airport A to Airport B would be a low and direct line, but I'll show you later in this presentation why that's not always the smartest route to take. So to go from airport A to airport B, typically you want to have a route, you want to have an altitude, and then your variables are going to start getting thrown at you when it comes to things like weather. But looking at the route portion first, the most efficient line would be a direct line from A to B, but that might not always be possible based on airspace and terrain. So that would be important to take into consideration in your flight planning. The next thing that you have to consider is altitude, and based on your aircraft or how long your flight is, it might make sense to continue the entire flight at a low level. However, if you have terrain or built up areas or water along your path, then you might need to select a higher altitude. And then lastly, of course, you want to consider weather because it is always going to throw some curveballs in your direction. And one of the advantages of being a pilot is the fact that there are no roads per se. You can actually go wherever you want, more or less depending on the rules. But since we're looking at giving you a license, you should know that there are places you should fly and should not fly, and it's your responsibility as the pilot in command to know your route and where it is that you're allowed to go and where it is that you're not allowed to go and plan accordingly. For example, if I was going to plan a flight from Boundary Bay to Qualicum Beach, I might just want to go direct. And same if I want to go from Langley to Qualicum Beach, I would want to go direct. It's the best way to save fuel. It's the fastest. Why not? But there are problems with that. One of them being, if I overlay the airspace of the VTA, you can see that there's a lot of airspace happening in this area, mainly the Vancouver Terminal airspace, which is right there in the direct path of your flight, as well as the terminal area, which sits above it and extends all the way out here. So as you can see, Heading direct might be most efficient. However, depending on the requirements of ATC and the fact that there are already defined VFR terminal routes on this map, you might not get the direct path that you're hoping for. And if you haven't planned for fuel for that, that might put you in a bit of a sticky situation. So when we say spend a lot of time studying your maps, it's not to torture you, but it's because we want to show you that there's a lot of detail involved in these maps. And ATC might expect you to say beyond the VFR route, which is designated on the map, or at least have planned for that. And same, we also have terminal class C routes, which are specifically for VFR traffic heading through class C terminal airspace when you're cleared through there. So again, it's not as though you can't go direct if they let you, but there's a really good chance I've had students be vectored all the way around and completely um, not make their destination when they thought they were going to. So really, this is why you're making the nav log. It's really for you to make sure that you plan ahead to make sure that your flight goes as planned. It guides you through all the relevant information that you need, and it can also be used to track your progress so that you can update your ETA en route um, given the weather conditions of the day. This is what a sample navigation log looks like. Looks complicated, looks scary, don't worry, we'll get there. Okay, that was a lot of information, so let's take a step back and think, how do I start this process? Step one, locate your point of departure and your destination. Draw a line in between the two and review the entire route of your flight to see if whether you can go straight there or if you go, have to go over, around, or above obstacles. Then draw your route on the map, start your nav log, and by nav log, I mean navigation log. 
So we're going to work through the nav log from left to right, and we're going to start here by finding checkpoints, right? So along the route of your flight that you've planned, you're going to have your point of departure followed by certain points along the way that you are going to want to note on your nav log. This is a sort of recipe of all of the checkpoints that you might want to include on your nav log. You can pause the screen if you want to read these notes, but just make sure in your flight planning that you're using highly visible landmarks wherever possible. There was this joke I remember hearing, which is that VFR is really modified IFR flying, which is I follow roads, I follow rivers, I follow railways, or it could be modified to I follow shorelines, I follow valleys, etc. So if you have a VFR or a visible landmark, make sure that you follow that. Examiners like to see that. And if you have a designated VFR route on your map, please ensure to include that whenever possible in your flight planning. If you are flying at the private level, you don't need to include VOR information, but if you want to start learning it early, they actually are helpful and you'll need to know them at the CPL level anyway. Moving along to the next section, we have the course and altitude part of the navigation log. Now, course is often referred to as track, but these cruising levels and flight levels are definitely going to be material that is going to be on your flight test. So make sure that you do know them and use them accordingly. For example, if you are traveling above 3000 feet AGL and eastbound, you are using odd thousand plus 500 feet for your altitudes. Okay, time to look at some VFR charts. In the VFR world, there are two charts that you want to know about. One is the VNC, the other is the VTA, and you'll see that they cover very different geographical surfaces. We'll start by looking at the VTA, which is short for VFR Terminal Area Chart, and you'll only require these if you're flying out of one of the seven busy terminal areas outlined in the map below. So the VTA is a much more detailed map, and again, you'll need them if you're flying out of those terminal areas. The VNCs cover a much larger geographical area and therefore have less detail but are more useful for traveling longer distances. So for example, for planning your 300 nautical mile or even your 150 possibly, depending on where you go, you will need a VNC. So unlike the CAP or the CFS or even the AIM, your VNCs don't actually have an expiration date. So the way that you can tell that they are current is by going to the NAV Canada website and verifying what their latest edition is. So um, for example, for Toronto, the VTA, uh, when I took this screenshot today, the most recent edition was edition 48. Um, and you'll find that edition number on the legend part of either your VNC or your VTA. And then if you verify that that number is the same as their most current version, then you have the most current chart. Let's review how you measure distances. So as I pointed out a couple slides ago, the VNC and the VTA do not have the same scale. Um, so if your school gave you an IKO chart rule or a ruler and you're trying to measure your distances for your flight, do make sure that you're using the proper scale as well as the proper measurement. Because as you can see on this chart rule, you have both start, statute miles and nautical miles. And I think most schools and most flight plans these days are done in nautical miles or knots. So as an example, remember I said I'd come back to the flight between Langley and Chilliwack. So this would be similar to a flight plan that I would have my students plan um, because it breaks the, the flight up into um, a way that you're avoiding a lot of these practice areas and you're more or less following a VFR landmark, which is the river, staying outside of all uh, the practice areas, etc. So what I would have the students do then is I would have them measure each part section by section. Obviously, the longer plate or the areas of the flight with the same heading, you can measure them all together, but that way you're getting a more realistic view of how long this flight could take you. So again, what you would do is you would line up your chart rule, remembering that you are using the appropriate scale depending on what scale your map is, whichever map that you are using. Once you're done measuring all your distances, then you can move on to the fun part, which is measuring headings. At this point, it's worth pointing out that true is not equal to magnetic when it comes to headings. And I'm gonna show you why it's probably a very good idea to do all of your flight planning in true, at least until you get the weather, before changing it all over to magnetic, such that you can use it in your aircraft with your magnetic compass. So when I'm lining up my aviation protractor, I'm making sure that I line it up north-south to make sure that I line it up parallel to those lines on the grid. And that means that all the readings that I'm getting off of this protractor are in degrees true. And the way that you use this little guy is you line up the very dead center of the protractor on your line. And I like to line it up nice and square, um, parallel to the lines that are on the chart. And then you read what's on the side of the protractor there. So this one is showing me that it's 81 degrees true is what that heading would be 
based on the line that I've drawn on the map. And remember that everything that I'm looking at right now is in degrees true. And I know what you're thinking. You're like, wait, we just talked about this. You said if I'm in the northern domestic airspace, you measure your cruising altitudes based on true track. And in the southern domestic airspace, you measure it magnetic track. Why on earth are you talking about true track when we're supposed to be talking about magnetic track? And remember, I said you might want to do all your flight planning in true because of weather. So we'll look at that right now. What's really important to remember is that when you're doing your initial flight planning, your weather information is given to you in degrees true, not in degrees magnetic. So when you're doing your initial flight planning, it's a really good idea to do everything in true together. So making your wind correction angles in degrees true. And then your very last step would be to convert that all to magnetic so that you can use it appropriately in your airplane. There will be an E6B tutorial on how to do this, but not in this video. It will be in another video. And I know, I know you're like, why can't I just use four flight? This is taking me so long. And the answer is, well, you can. And the truth is I use it all the time. If you have an app like Flight Plan Go, which is actually available for free, you don't even have to buy four flight, but if you just go to their map section, hit edit, and then plot all of your lines onto their map, then you can actually build a flight plan very easily. Um, but the important thing is that you know what it is that you're doing. I say the same thing all the time. Why do they still teach long division in school? Everybody just uses a calculator. Nobody pulls out a piece of paper and does all these weird calculations. But the point being that when you divide a number, you know the process that it takes to get there and what it does. Very similar with flight planning. The technology is good and I encourage that you use it, but you also have to know what it is you're doing. Otherwise your answer might not make sense and that's important. So when I pop all those points into edit and then click on root, it actually gives me this really nice nav log. And in a no wind condition, this would actually work really well for me. All my distances are there. It actually gives me coordinates, which is pretty handy. And my course is all there, but they're given to me in magnetic. And so if I wanted to do any kind of wind correction with this, I would have to first convert it back to true, correct it with the wind using a 6 b and then convert it back. Let's just take a second and talk about 10 degree drift lines. So this doesn't actually go on your nav log, this goes on your map. So what you're gonna do is along your track line, I want you to draw a line on either side, 10 degrees splayed outwards from your track in order to tell you whether or not you are staying on course. So this is because when you are doing your ground speed check, if you are not on your track line, if you're off course, the 10 degree drift lines can give you an indication of how many degrees you have to correct um, in either direction in order to maintain your track and therefore make your track made good. So for example, when you're flying along, you use those lines in order to correct your track so that you can show the examiner that you're capable of doing so. Okay, so we're moving along here. We've got our checkpoints, we've got our course headings, and we've got our um, distances plugged in here. Now we need to look at altitude choice. So once you have a route, you can go about selecting your best choice of altitude. And when I say choice of altitudes, that's actually because the situation might dictate. It depends really on your aircraft performance. It depends on things like weather. If you have stronger winds in your favor at altitude or stronger winds against your favor at altitude, cloud heights can be a limiting factor because they keep you potentially lower. And airspace could be a factor as well. For example, if you're flying in a terminal area and you can't get into class C restricted airspace especially flying around the Vancouver area, we have very densely compacted airspaces. And so going via the upper route might make a lot of sense. However, you might get restricted to an altitude because terminal sometimes just closes off to VFR traffic and they don't want you in there at all. Um, so knowing this could be very important, even having a flight plan that involves two different altitudes might actually be very helpful depending on how the day goes. Also, your choice of altitude might really depend on your aircraft performance, your time to climb and fuel burn, and whether or not your choice of altitude could give you potentially a more direct route if you go higher than if you decide to stay lower. One thing that you'll have to look up for your flight planning is how long it takes your aircraft to get to altitude. Remember that your airplane's not going to jump up to 4,000 feet. It's going to take a certain amount of time in order to climb to that particular height. And that really does depend on not only aircraft performance, but also the outside conditions of the day of the environment. For example, if it's a hot day and you don't have to get to altitude rapidly, you might want to plan for an en route climb at a higher airspeed for better engine cooling and overall better performance of your aircraft. If you have terrain or if you are flying through airspace, as we discussed before, then you might want to plan for climbing at BY to get to altitude as soon as possible and then continue on from there. 
And if you are perhaps flying through mountainous terrain and you have a significant amount of terrain and you have to get to altitude before you even continue on course, you might actually have to plan for additional time and fuel to climb over top of the airport before proceeding on course. So make sure that you do plan for that in your flight plan. So for example, if I was going from, say, Hope to somewhere like Merritt, um, notice that there's a lot of really high terrain in this area. So I might want a flight plan with a climb up through the valley where it's nice and low until I get to altitude and then I can jump up across the mountain range here. Similarly, if I'm going from Qualicum Beach and I have to cross this large body of water, I might want to climb to a specific altitude along the shoreline and then take it back towards across the water at altitudes that I have, say, gliding distance shore if that's what I want. Now let's talk about something that I feel is often missed in navigation planning, and that is how to use your en route resources. What I want you to do is I want you to sweep the map and I want you to look for boxes. Yes, boxes. You probably already found the boxes for airspace and frequency boundaries when you were doing your flight planning. You're also going to find box text referring you to area warnings and other areas of reference, such as the back of the VTA. Um, so heed these, read through them, and make sure if they are applicable to your flight that you're aware of what they're trying to tell you. Look for the boxes that refer to the local call-up points because if ATC is directing you to fly directly to one of those points, they'll refer to it by name. If you haven't looked up the point or if you forget what it's called, just let them know that you are unfamiliar. And also, if you want to use some radio aids along your route or practice with them, they are good to look up. And you might also want to write down or circle who to call up if you want to talk to Flight Information Services or FIC. On that topic, they are on the VTA, but they're also located in the CFS. In section C, you'll find the most common RCOs where you can talk to FIC, basically give them pyre ups, update your flight plan, etc. I do recommend looking them up. So there you have it, the first four columns pretty much talked about. There's a lot more to cover on this topic, which is why I split it up, but I'll be continuing in other videos.